So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the three people on the stage who are going to speak to you um, about the concept of internationalization and transform transformational experiences for students and academics. Um, they are, um, not in the order in your program, but they are uh, uh, the Honorary Phil Honeywood, uh, Doric, uh, Dr. Eric Lithander, and Professor Ken Anderson, who will speak first. And uh, the session uh, will hopefully have a capacity for Q&A uh, at the end, rather than at the end of the, each of the three. So um, it's very much up to me to keep them in time, uh, and I'll, I'll try and do that. Um, just a little bit of context before I, I, um, I open the floor to them. Um, this session is about the state of play in internationalization in higher education. And the OLT has supported a significant amount of work aimed at scoping and understanding the prevailing factors informing uh, internationalization of higher education. And this discussion is about progressing that um, body of work. So um, would you join me in welcoming the three of them uh, to, to address us? Kent, I gather you're going first. Thank you very much. And I too want to add my uh, acknowledgement of the indigenous people and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, as introduced, my name is Kent Anderson. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor of International at University of Adelaide. And I purposefully picked a title that was as big and as broad as possible so that on the Qantas 6 a.m. flight to Sydney, I could throw in whatever I wanted to throw in. Um, but I do think I have some interesting things to say, and I am trying to build an argument. I, I begin, though, with a truism, and perhaps an assumed truism, but that is international education is transformative. It leads our students to have an international outlook, to have intercultural understanding, and indeed to have higher retention rates, to have improved academic performance, and increased employability. So rather than spend a lot of time saying international education isn't that a good thing, I'm gonna take that bit as assumed. I can give you references for all of those assertions if you'd like. But then the question is, well, if edu international education is such a great thing, how can we get more of it? And the first thing to say is, even if you want more of it, what a great time to be in international education. It is perhaps the best time in the history of the world to be focused on international education. First, let's look at international student mobility. International student mobility, we normally use two definitions of this. The first is what we call degree mobility. That's where someone goes from country A to country B to study for a degree. And those are the round circles we have up there. And the round circles, the last one says in 2011, 4.3 million people were traveling to do a full degree. And the predictions are that by 2025, that will be 7.2 million people. And you can see that line of increase, over 10% over the past few years. Um, and that was originally predicted to be 2 to 5%, but we're out achieving that. It's interesting, though, to pause on that for a minute. It's not as simplistic as it looks. And there's actually some subtrends within there. And let me just highlight the three most important ones. The first is, particularly over the last, since 2005, indeed, those circles are increasing in size. But overwhelmingly, that's a story of Chinese students moving around the world. It swamps all of the numbers of any other country. And overwhelmingly, they're going to very specific destinations, English-speaking countries, US, UK, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. A third trend that comes through, which you can't see there, is that the second kind of thing, other than Chinese students moving, that we see is intra-region mobility. And in our region, the Asia Pacific, overwhelmingly, that's movement within Asia, particularly Southeast Asia to Northeast Asia, and Northeast Asia to Northeast Asia. But it's also a story that happens within Africa and a story we know happens within Europe. The second graph there 
You don't have to read the numbers, just look that it goes like that. The second graph is what we call credit mobility. That's what we used to call study abroad or intra-degree mobility. There are no global statistics on this, so instead I just throw up the US data there. The Australian data actually would be a sharper curve. It would be shorter but sharper. But that US data there shows you that since um, over the last three decades, excuse me, two decades, we've trebled the number of intra-degree credit mobility that's in the United States. Again, if you looked at the Australian graph, it would be even sharper than that. Um, and if you looked at the Europe graph, it also would be in the same direction. We don't have global data for this, but the trend is overwhelmingly obvious that not only those that are going for full degree, but those that are doing a degree, the number of ones uh, doing student mobility is increasing. I do have three cautions, though, before we go that, uh, beyond that. The first is on the, the top one. That shows the wonderful increase, but remember that still 99.5% of students are not moving internationally for their degrees. And that has been consistent over this increase we see in size. So what's happened is, as systems around the world have massified, the percentage doing international degrees has stayed constant at about 0.5%. Also, I already mentioned overwhelmingly the mobility is about China. And on the uh, credit mobility, the short-term mobility, overwhelmingly that's a conversation for a small number of very rich developed countries, namely North America, continental Europe, and Australia, that has not spread except for very, very small numbers to other parts of the world. But it's not only international students where we're doing well. International research as well. Uh, the top graph, again, you don't need to know the specifics, but that's three lines uh, showing you Europe, North America, and West, uh, West Pacific, which is our definition of Asia and the Pacific, and the increase in G and D, uh, excuse me, um, R and D spending. The one on the other corner is the increase in co-publication with an international co-author. And what that one says is now, across the world, 35% of the research outputs are done co-publication with international research uh, publication. In Australia, it's closer to 50%. In New Zealand, closer to 55%. The United States is about that 35%. Singapore, obviously, the higher than that. Um, so what we have, and a third graph I haven't put on there, is overall science outputs or science publication outputs, and again, a, a graph going the same way. So the amount of money being spent internationally on R&D is going up. That is producing more publications internationally, and the percentage of those publications, which is international, two people from different countries publishing together is now one in three, and again, that's gone up, and in a country like Australia, that's 50%. So international research, just like international uh, students, we're hitting it for six. We've got two other areas that are coming into play around international education, and the first is provider mobility. Provider mobility is when an institution sets up an international branch campus, and that's a defined term. But under that defined term, we know roughly 20 years ago, there were very, very few of these. There were a handful, uh, but there were very few. But today, there's just over 200. So the British Council counts 201. Um, I, excuse me, Global Higher Ed out of uh, SUNY counts just over uh, 200 uh, without at least 14 new ones in the works. And the thing that international provider mobility provides is you can have an international experience without leaving your home country is the concept behind that. And so we think that is a wonderful thing. And the next one, which Eric will talk more about, of course, is the boom we've seen in digital kinds of virtual mobility. And Eric will talk about this most recent one since 2012, 2013, the MOOCs. But remember, the whole digital revolution, and particularly the video digital revolution, followed on the back of the infrastructure set up by the distance learning and really has been going on for a good two decades now of having students engage internationally without leaving their home. 
by doing it through video, Skype, and other means. We've also had in this period an expansion of education hubs. So we see Dubai, Singapore, um, Iskandar, Kuala Lumpur, um, Incheon in Korea, where governments have said, we want international education in these spots. We're going to encourage people to set up uh, providers and we're going to encourage international students to come out of, the, uh, to come to those places. So again, even when taken with an international uh, provider or virtual mobility, what a wonderful time to be in international education. It even gets better. Governments love us. So here we've got two photos. This is um, uh, the current prime minister with the new Colombo plan launch, and next to it, the previous prime minister at the Asia Bound launch, um, both standing up to launch differently named programs that look pretty similar, um, saying, we think there should be more students uh, moving uh, abroad and internationally. And it's not just the Aussies. 100,000 K or the 100,000 strong project is the Americans effort to get 100,000 students to China. The Japanese one, Tobitate or takeoff program is to get 300,000 Japanese students moving. Science Without Borders is the Brazilian program. Uh, Chinese Scholarship Council you'll be familiar with, with the students in your system. And AIMS is just another example. That's the ASEAN International Mobility Scheme, which incorporates those countries within ASEAN and Japan. All of the countries are aligned in doing this. They're all putting serious money into it. So just with regards to the new Colombo plan, 100 million additional dollars over the five years of that program. And that all builds to Vladivostok. And Vladivostok is, uh, in 2012, around the APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Communities, the 21 economies uh, that make up APEC came together in the leaders' decula declaration in October, excuse me, November 2012, um, where they said, that's right, we think this is a uh, uh, good for governments, we want to put more energy behind this, and therefore we'll take it to the regional level. I should have mentioned when we're looking at governments, why are they interested? Well, one, there's the trade aspects. This is an, an export, and this can bring in economy. Um, the second is the human capacity building, having internationally trained people. And then the third is the belief in a knowledge economy uh, going forward, dependent both on homegrown research and on migration. So APEC came out in 2012 with this declaration Annex D that was reaffirmed last year in October 2013 at Bali. But basically it says we're gonna do four things. We're gonna enhance student mobility. We're going to enhance researcher mobility. We're going to enhance provider mobility. Just skip that next one, doesn't really matter. And subsequently we've added on to that enhanced virtual mobility. And that agenda is running now, and it provides the mechanism, the vehicle, for increases and gains to be made on this already progressive agenda that we're on. It can't get any rosier, but should we pause? I'm suggesting we should pause to have a thought about three uh, challenges we face. The first is equity, the second is scale, and the third is authenticity. I have two minutes and so I will go quickly. The challenge of equity. Again, as I already said, 99.5% of students are not doing degree mobility. Even for credit mobility in the most high performing countries in the world, the United States and Australia, 90% are not given that opportunity. What that effect is, uh, or and even within that 90, uh, the 10% that are moving there, these are just my University of Adelaide numbers, but we tested and 64% of those going are from the top SES category. And only 5% are from the bottom SES category. So while we're increasing the number that are going, we're actually entrenching the class of rich globally inclined students who are the mobile ones. And indeed, what we're trying to transition to in my institution and what I'm promoting is that we look for all students. The second challenge is of scale. The challenge of scale 
addresses equity, if we can spread this out more, um, but we have challenges in achieving scale. The first is right now, study abroad is looked at as a nice extra. It's seen as something where there's a limited supply and so we have to restrict it. And there are significant opportunity costs more so than financial costs. By that, what I mean is students are not taking up this opportunity because they can't break away from the social structures that they have in their, in their universities at right now. The third challenge is if you address that scale challenge with short-term programs, and then you begin to package those short-term programs, then is it really an authentic international experience if someone spends one week on a guided Kontiki tour for credit to Bali? Is it authentic? Should that be credited the same way other experiences are? Um, and that is a challenge for the sector. So in conclusion, is there a policy response? The truth is, my real point today was to introduce the APEC mechanism as a mechanism in a, in a vehicle for discussing this, but I thought it would be pretty lame of me just to leave on those challenges. And so I do have a, a policy response that I'm happy to discuss in questions, and that is what we at the University of Adelaide are calling open access student mobility. And three pillars behind that. One is that it is mainstream, not an add-on. The second is that we do embrace short term. And the third though, is that it's integrated with our partners rather than standalone from them. Thank you very much. My apologies for the time. Thank you very much. And we'll move straight on to, to Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the OLT for putting on their first conference. I think uh, it's a remarkable professional effort by a government, we can't say government department, but by a government authority to be able to do such a wonderful uh, event. And I think it was, um, uh, the registration was pretty good too, uh, compared to most conferences. I think it was actually free as I understand it, so that's great. Um, I'd also like to say that if you're absolutely riveted by the three presenters today, you can hop on the Cafe Pacific flight overnight tomorrow night and join all three of us in Hong Kong at the Chinese University of Hong Kong where we're presenting on research collaboration and student mobility for a two-day symposium at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So um, we're becoming the three amigos. So much so that I'm going to paraphrase the abstract of Eric Lithander, who's our next speaker. And Eric and I touched base on this uh, beforehand. And uh, you'll read in the program that Eric's going to be speaking about the disruptive and potentially transformative effect of new technology when it comes to changes for institutions. I'm going to paraphrase to say I'm talking now about the disruptive and potentially transformative effect of changes of government and changes of vice chancellors on internationalisation strategies of universities. And it's not yet entirely well understood what these are, but there seems to be consensus that it's likely to be profound in one way or another. This session will explore the extent to which changes of government and changes of vice chancellors or institutional reorganisation pose a genuine threat to what has surely been one of the unsung success stories of Australian diplomacy and economic growth, namely our education, international education sector. So first to our friends in government. And there were some of us involved in this sector, in this industry of international education who pined uh, excuse the pun, pined for a international education minister. Um, we wanted our own one-stop shop in federal government that we could go to with all the woes and all the exciting challenges for international education. Unfortunately, we've never achieved that with Labor or Liberal governments, and I guess in some ways it was probably a pipe dream anyway, because unless a minister for a portfolio has got cabinet clout, they're never going to be effective. And so if we had a Minister for International Education, they'd more than likely be not in Cabinet, therefore would not have a department briefing them, and therefore would not have clout. So what do we finish up with instead? With both Labor and Liberal, we finish up with not one, not two, but five departments and six federal ministers at the moment, all determining our fate. And uh, I guess those in the audience here would know, of course, and uh, know and have got to love a number of those ministers, um, be it the Minister for Education, Christopher Pine, be it, of course, uh, Julie Bishop in Foreign Affairs, who now has charge of the new Colombo Plan, be it Ian McFarlane in Industry, who's got charge of VET internationalisation, be it um, Scott Morrison, who is officially in charge of immigration, but has handballed student visas to Senator Michaeli 
Cash, his assistant minister, albeit Andrew Robb in trade. So if you can understand for a moment what it's like being uh, in charge of a big body that has to lobby for one sector on international education, bashing up against six ministers' doors, um, and hence the uh, front cover of my association's Vista magazine recently, which had, who are you going to call with the phone hanging off the line? Um, but what that means is, of course, that we really have to argue for greater collaborative effort, because without collaborative effort across government, you get these ridiculous decisions that are made in splendid isolation. And the classic example of that was a budgetary decision last year um, by the then Labor government without any warning to impose a new onshore student visa charge of $700. So already Australia has almost the highest student visa charge of $535. Uh, that can be to come and do a three-week English language course in this country. Then after your three-week English language course, if you decide that you want to segue into a diploma or a degree, that will be another $700. We're the only country in the world that's got anything like this student visa charge regime, but a budgetary decision made in splendid isolation by immigration department without consulting education department, without consulting trade department. So that's the type of issue that we're up against in this sector. We do, however, have collaboration via a number of stakeholder mechanisms, and I sit on three of those at the moment. That's the Education Visa Consultative Committee chaired by Immigration Department, where Austrade and the Education Department appear at those meetings under the title of any other business. Um, we then have the um, new, uh, new Colombo Plan, which Kent Anderson and I both sit on, and that is chaired by the uh, Foreign Affairs Department because Julie Bishop decided that New Colombo Plan was her pet project and she managed to persuade Tony Abbott to give her $100 million of new money uh, to, over a five-year period to implement that program. And then we have a separate body called the, which you'll get to know and love over the coming months, called the uh, Tesco Advisory Council, uh, which is charged, you know, chaired by the uh, Education Department, and we're looking at the whole regulatory regime for that wonderful agency that you've got to know, if not love, um, the Tertiary Education Quality Standards Authority. So uh, there's plenty of me mechanisms in place for collaboration, but it's just trying to get government to understand the need for a cross-government uh, collaboration and consultation. In that regard, we're still waiting on the outcomes of the Michael Cheney report, where Michael Cheney was charged by the previous government with actually coordinating international education uh, and making recommendations. Happily, he recommended there should be one ministerial coordinating council for international education, and 18 months later, we're still waiting to find out if that's going to happen. We then look quickly at the state economies, and of course, uh, hands up those of you who've uh, enjoyed the wonders of a state education mission to China, to any other country in the world. Only one, right, from Tasmania, all right. Hands up those who've got to enjoy the delights of a federal government mission going overseas to spruik your institution. No? OK, so the vice-chancellors have got the monopoly on that. Um, well, what you find, of course, is that some of these missions have got great goals to try and you know, really promote the state's economy, to promote uh, Australia and brand Australia. But, of course, often they, uh, there's a lot of window dressing, a lot of showcasing, but not much goes on in terms of implementation to follow up. But at least Queensland, Victoria and New South Wales have now got coordinating councils in charge of international education. Then we look at the impacts uh, at the government departmental level. And as I mentioned, DFAT now has the primary role in New Colombo Plan. But as Kent mentioned, of course, New Colombo Plan is very much Asian focused. And I guess the concern that you have as academics is many of our traditional student mobility programs have engaged with Europe, have engaged with North America. So just when we got used to Australian students flying over Asia to embark upon their study abroad experience in Europe or North America, along comes the Asian century, uh, the white paper, and everything that's followed on from that. So we've finally discovered our backyard, but clearly there are implications there for many of your institutions when it comes to what's going to happen by way of government funding for other genuine important mobility programs that are often longer term, semester based or longer um, with Europe and with North America. And there's a danger that we're going to just get totally distracted by Asia in the, the wash up of that. So then we look at Asian short term mobility and also as Kent mentioned, you'll find that 85% of Australian students who go to Asia on a mobility program 
are engaged in short-term mobility. My son, classic example, Master of um, Education at the University of Melbourne, did a three-week mobility stint in Myanmar, teaching at two schools, writing a reflective essay about intercultural teaching, but it was a three-week mobility program. Many reasons for that, uh, particularly in terms of capacity for Asian institutions to teach programs in English and so on, but at the end of the day, clearly that has a key implication for your roles. For example, my son was accompanied by two University of Melbourne academics. What rate of pay, what, uh, I guess, remuneration, or what was involved in their employment contracts to encourage them to give up their teaching role, give up their research role, and hot foot her off to Myanmar for three weeks to look after some students involved in a short-term mobility program. And that's a, an area in which I think more work needs to be done in terms of the value proposition for academics in being asked and being put upon to get more involved in those mobility programs. Of course, what that does mean, though, is that hopefully there'll be opportunities opening up for greater research and curriculum collaboration with our Asian partners as the MOUs are dusted off and real mobility takes place. And of course, this also leads to transnational education opportunities. For example, RMIT Vietnam, Monash Malaysia, Curtin Singapore, Swinburne Kuching. And as a member of the new Colombo Plan Steering Committee, I'm pleased to say that we're act actually looking at how we can ensure that Australian students do get exposure to some of those offshore campuses of Australian institutions in order to get the crit critical mass we need, but not to have them in a bubble as such, so they're just going, having a, uh, an expatriate experience rather than a genuine cultural experience in those Asian institutions. Of course, the other issue we've got there is how do we promote Brand Australia? And that's been a vexed issue for some time now between governments. We've got Australian Education International, which we can no longer call it that. It's now part of the International Group of Education Department versus Austrade. What's that led to? Well, over a two-year period, there's been no education counsellor in the Middle East until recently when Austrade put a 0.5 person in. So there was nobody available in the Middle East with education expertise working for either education department or for Austrade. And clearly, they, that's a major perception problem when it comes to us competing against North America and Europe for Middle East students and Middle East engagement. And then we have VET. And VET uh, was told by Michael Knight three years ago under his review, their future lay in offshore delivery. And I think that's become a vexed issue for them because uh, it's very difficult to balance the books when you've got to send expatriate teachers teaching VET courses offshore. Of course, when we look at the transformative and disruptive effects of government, then we also come to the philosophical imperatives that come along, um, I won't say as baggage, but they come along with any change of government. And uh, some of those include, of course, that uh, David Kemp, uh, the, the philosophical warrior that he's been for many years on my side of politics, David Kemp finally got his voucher system up, um, or looks as though he will, which I guess Denise Bradley in some way would have uh, endorsed because Denise's report was very much about the need to expand higher education offerings to non-public institutions. So it looks as though the money flow following the student, or what money there is left following the student, um, will actually prevail and that uh, there will be an expansion, obviously, into private higher education providers, which brings us to the interesting issue of how to how does government fund those private providers? Um, for my sins, I'm one of five people on the Tesco Advisory Council. One of the key challenges we, we've got at the moment is looking at the funding formula. How do we respect the fact that public institutions have a research endeavour, have a research effort as part of their DNA? How do we respect the fact that often uh, it's the public universities that take on students with special needs? How do we build that into a funding formula so that the community college type syndrome in North America is the funding formula that uh, might prevail as distinct from uh, providing private colleges with a similar funding arrangement to what public institutions get whilst not acknowledging the differences in the DNA between them. And then that all leads, of course, into that whole issue of the lighter touch regulatory regime uh, because with lighter touch, does that mean less regulation is good or does that mean less regulation equates to quality uh, being compromised? And that's a uh, a game in play at the moment. And of course then we have the offshore delivery issues. As Kent referred to, a lot of institutions around the globe, global institutions, want to deliver offshore. Um, and of course I can well recall the AUQUA audit when I was a Swinburne University governing council member for the Kuching campus and the 
absolute um, uh, focus of the whole of Swinburne on that audit at the time. Hopefully, we're going to ensure that the quality of our academic endeavour and our delivery offshore and offshore campuses is such that we don't have too much of a light touch when it comes to uh, accreditation and uh, quality control. So let's look for a moment and move on to the transformative and disruptive effects of institutional reorganisation. And uh, vice chancellors who need to turn the place upside down. I won't ask for a show of hands there <laughs> if you experience that. But as a former minister for universities in Victoria, uh, what I couldn't help but notice was that every change of vice chancellor at the University of Melbourne uh, involved the whole place being turned upside down. So we had Melbourne University private there at one point, which was an interesting experiment. Uh, then uh, Glynn came along with the Melbourne model. Um, we can't call it, we're not allowed to call it the Melbourne model anymore, but it certainly um, turned the place upside down. But it also turned Australia upside down. I think UWA have now got a similar uh, delivery model as well. Um, so it's just interesting how the disruptive effects of vice chancellors um, is, very, is, a, is a strong point when it comes to institutional reorganisation. Have you been Ernst & Young? Um, some of the big accounting firms have got their templates. You've been deloited, have you? Okay, you've been deloited. Okay, <laughs> we'll compare. We'll compare templates later. But the key point I want to make there is that in international education, should faculties have the primary role? Should an international office at the centre have a primary role? Does there have to be a clash? And how do we strike the right balance? Because at the end of the day, I believe that inter internal collaboration is the key to successfully implementing an international vision for any institution. And certain vice chancellors are showing a preference, I guess, as internationalization becomes more multi-layered with research collaboration, with curriculum design across around the globe, with many I issues associated with the partnerships with external institutions now having to be um, better down and implemented rather than just getting students in from other institutions into Australia. What that means is that I guess if I'm a vice chancellor, I'm going to tend to show preference to my faculties to drive the international endeavour. But of course, that can be at the expense of the knowledge, the networks, the expertise that's been built up by a very good central international office. And I won't name him, but one vice chancellor of an Australian institution was known to refer to his international office as the baggage handlers. So that type of descriptor doesn't, uh, uh, I guess, bode well for proper internal collaboration where the two areas of international endeavour, the faculties and the international central office, are both respected and both supported across the institution. And that comes down to then who should implement the international vision. And I guess that really cultural change is important. We need cultural change that recognises co-dependency, partnerships, genuine partnerships between academic and professional staff, shared design and implementation of the strategy, joint learning and professional development, which my association attempts to do along with others to ensure that we bring academics and the uh, professional staff together to overcome competitive internal barriers. And also, of course, that has implications for overseas partner institutions. When I was minister in Victoria, uh, of course, there was this wonderful habit of faculty heads to fly off overseas and sign MOUs, sometimes at a bar late at night in an exotic locale, an exotic Asian city, whatever. And then they'd come back with the MOU and leave it to others sometimes to implement or it would just gather dust. Clearly, we've moved beyond that. Australia is much more respected and much more involved in genuine collaborative effort, uh, but we obviously need to ensure that the right people are doing that and that there's genuine internal collaboration and knowledge across the institution as to the various rights and prerogatives of who should be doing that, and hopefully it's been done as a team endeavour. So I'll leave it at that and um, hand on to Eric. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you. Thanks for, thanks for having me. So ANU's first MOOC, so we're on the edX platform. Uh, our first MOOC was developed uh, by Brian Schmidt, in, in part by Brian Schmidt, our, our recent Nobel Prize winner. And it's called um, The Greatest Unsolved Mysteries of the Universe. And up until recently, I thought that the future impact of MOOCs on higher education and international higher education 
uh, was one of the great unsolved mysteries of the universe, or at least it was until the 13th of May, uh, when now, of course, the greatest unsolved mystery of the universe is the future shape of the Australian higher education system uh, in the deregulated fee environment, and in particular, the great mystery of how we find out uh, how we set domestic fees. But that's a discussion we can have tonight over a glass of wine, perhaps. Uh, what I'm going to do for the next 15 minutes or so is focus on um, the unsolved mystery of the impact that MOOCs is potentially going to have on international higher education. So let's get the, the awkward part out of the way. Uh, how many of you have uh, started a MOOC? Okay, so one of the, uh, one of the um, unintended consequences of my Swedish Lutheran social democratic background is that I'm a terrible liar. And I'm not going to pretend actually that I have because I haven't started a MOOC. And the reason for that is quite simple and it's not very sophisticated. It's that when I do have an hour or two free in the evening, uh, like yourselves, I have a busy schedule, I travel a lot. Uh, I wanna have a glass of wine and have a chat to my wife and maybe read a book and not sit in front of a screen and take on additional information. Um, I think my drive towards self-improvement isn't strong enough, probably. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. The, the, so the observations that I'm making are entirely based on the theory of MOOCs rather than any, any personal experience. So in order to answer the question of what the impact will be on international higher education, let's define uh, international higher education. Let's, let's look at it two ways. Let's look at it first in the narrow sense of international student recruitment, and then looks, let's look at it a little bit broader in terms of potentially the role that MOOCs could have on helping to develop capacity in, in the broader higher education system. I think that's probably a more intriguing question. So first things first, will, will fewer international students come to Australia because they can do MOOCs for free from the comfort of their living room? I think the first thing to ask is, is whether our prospective international students are even taking MOOCs. And although I acknowledge that it's early days and the numbers change every single day, I think broadly speaking, the answer is no. I think as we know, 80% uh, of MOOC takers already have a university degree and 90% of them drop out. A 2013 study of the MOOCs at Harvard showed that 43% of their students were Americans. And no other country had more than 10% of the enrollments. India was just under 10%. There was a long tail with small numbers of students from a large number of countries, but no other country surpassed 5% of the enrollments in the Harvard MOOCs. And in terms of the attainment rate and the completion rate of the MOOCs, five of the top six countries in terms of completion rate were European countries. So why aren't more students in the developing world taking MOOCs? Well, one answer presumably is access to the internet. The International Telecommunications Union says that 61% of the world's population doesn't use the internet yet. In terms of usage by region, in Africa, the usage, usage is only 16%, in Asia, 32%, and in the Arab states, 38%. And according to the same study, less than 10% of the world's population has access to broadband. Uh, that's only 6.1% in the developing world. And less than 20% of the developing world has access to mobile broadband. The other obstacle to taking MOOCs, I think, is English language ability. So I know that there are MOOC providers in France, Spain, Brazil, the Middle East, Germany, China, and the, the list is growing every day, but I think the reality is that the vast bulk of MOOCs are still delivered in English. It's interesting to note that the first MOOC delivered in Hindi was not developed by the University of Delhi or by one of the IITs, but rather by ANU. So you'll notice that I've been a bit disingenuous with this first part of the analysis because I think we can probably agree that the students who neither have access to the internet or speak English are probably not realistically future international students of Australia. But if you do look at the ones who do have access to the internet and who do speak English, there are tens of millions of existing prospective international students who now technically have the option to turn down an, op an opportunity to come to Australia. Uh, and pay fees for their study, and instead stay at home with their parents for three or four years and study on their mobile phone or on their laptop. But for me, the two things that are probably going to prevent um, MOOCs from stealing market share, if I can call it that, from traditional universities is immigration and employment. So we know that a significant driver for international students in coming here 
or coming to other receiving countries is the prospect of, of immigration. So unless you plan to emigrate as an avatar, uh, immigration isn't something which uh, is a pathway through a MOOC. And secondly, at least so far, employers haven't taken the leap of faith of equating a successful attainment of MOOCs uh, with the attainment of a degree from a traditional university. I do think that the day that a major global employer turns around and s declares that they will consider students who have completed, let's say, 30 MOOCs uh, as having the equivalent knowledge and skills of a graduate with a bachelor's degree, that day the game does start to change. Uh, and even more terrifying, of course, will be the day when employers not only start accepting MOOCs as sufficient evidence of work readiness, but start running MOOCs themselves. Um, therefore, stripping institutions like ours from the monopoly of graduate skills development that we've enjoyed for hundreds of years. But for the moment, at least, uh, I would argue that there may even be some positive impacts of MOOCs on international student recruitment. For instance, a MOOC might pique the interest of a student who was not considering studying overseas because they're inspired by their teacher or by the content of the MOOC. Uh, this, of course, only makes a difference if the student has the means with which to do something about it, such as moving uh, to a different country and affording the cost. Secondly, MOOCs could better prepare our future students by familiarizing them with our teaching styles. For the non-English speakers, it would give them an opportunity to practice in university-level instruction in their chosen academic field in English prior to coming to our campuses, thus improving their ability to assimilate knowledge when they do start their course. And thirdly, the Im improvement of the on-campus learning environment that universities should be achieving as a consequence of their involvement in MOOCs should help us all deliver a better education and better educational experiences, uh, making us attractive to all students, not only international students. Well, I suppose from that perspective, we might as well be asking whether MOOCs could potentially have an impact on domestic student recruitment. Will an Australian domestic student who wishes to avoid the consequences of the undergraduate fee deregulation move to MOOCs instead? Uh, no, I think they'll move to New Zealand instead. But that's a different discussion altogether. So the more interesting consideration, perhaps, and now we move into the broader definition of international higher education as being capacity building, is the role that MOOCs could play in helping to develop higher education capacity across the region. Uh, with, a, with the help of a PhD student at ANU, I did a study which looked at demographic trends across the 10 most populous countries in Asia, uh, correlating those trends with government targets for participation rates in the relevant university age cohort of 18 to 23. And the result is that if those countries are to meet their own uh, self-declared targets for participation by 2020, there'll have to be a 43% increase in the number of students accessing higher education. So by my calculations, that means that those countries are th currently 32 million places short of being able to deliver that education based on their existing capacity. And what's more, if you applied existing staff-student ratios in those institutions in those countries, you would have to hire almost one and a half million new academics between now and 2020 in order to teach those additional 32 million students. That's almost 200,000 new academics a year in a system which doesn't currently produce very many PhD students. And those figures only pertain to 10 countries in Asia. If we added the Middle East and Latin America and Africa, uh, the numbers would be even more astonishing. So surely online education does have a role to play, and even MOOCs have a role to play in addressing this capacity uh, shortfall. I find it very difficult to believe that the explosive rate of, of um, growth in the world's higher education systems that will be required to meet these targets can be achieved without very significant compromises in quality. Something else to keep in mind is that the demographic curve in these countries is such that although there's a very sharp upward trajectory in demand at the moment among 18 to 23 year olds, pretty soon that demand tapers off because of demographic trends, which means that if these countries that are affected invest significantly in additional capacity today, in just a few years, they may find that they have significant excess capacity when the relevant age group diminishes. Now clearly the prospect of online education contributing to this capacity building does come up against the problem of internet access that we discussed earlier. Uh, and in my mind, it would be essential that the online education be delivered uh, by 
uh, local institutions to ensure that the content is appropriate from a cultural perspective and in, in terms of learning styles, even if it's done in partnership with uh, an overseas partner. So in conclusion, whether you're looking at the impact of MOOCs on international higher education as defined as our future ability to recruit international students, or by the broader definition of the development of higher education, uh, where there's the greatest need, the answer to my question, I suppose, is yes, sort of. Uh, MOOCs, at least, or at least some form of online education, will have a significant impact on the world of international higher education as we know it. I think what I have to do now is call Brian Schmidt uh, and ask him if he can perhaps turn his attention to resolving exactly how different that world is going to be. Thank you. Well, the speakers were good to their word and uh, have left us with about 10 minutes for, for questions. So um, how I propose to do this uh, is, as we've been operating, if you um, identify yourself and your institution and if you could wait for the mic to, to come, uh, and if you want a follow-up question after the answer, please wait for the mic because uh, that way we can all hear the, the dialogue. So, um, roving mics are now uh, spreading around the room, uh, so the field is open for, for a question. I can't see one at the moment. I have a question for Eric, but I don't have a mic. <laughs> ah. My name is Dorothy Dix. <laughs> um, Eric, um, you, you paint this vision uh, where people might be moving because of, or might not be moving because of, of MOOCs, but isn't the demographics even worse when you know that over 80% of the people doing MOOCs are males with a BA already in hand? And so, um, whereas we know international education, the movement overwhelmingly is at bachelor, sub-bachelor, level, uh, so it isn't even bleaker than, than you predict. Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't disagree with that. I think what's going to be very interesting to see is whether um, local institutions are, can develop MOOCs of high quality in their own language and, and in their own context. I think that, that potentially can, can, that can have an impact on mobility. The way they're configured at the moment, I don't see, uh, it, I mean, famous last words, I don't see MOOCs having a an, an immediate impact. Okay. There's a question over in the right-hand corner there, by the pillar. Roy Tasker from uh, University of Western Sydney. Um, last year, I had the joy of uh, going on a China showcase tour um, uh, organized by Austrade, and uh, we visited 10 schools in China north, south, east, and west. It was an amazing trip. And uh, I was so impressed by the students that uh, I met. But you know, I racked my brain for good reasons, compelling reasons for why these students should study in Australia rather than uh, the United States and Europe. And uh, I'd be interested to know what people in the audience and in the panel uh, would put as uh, big compelling advantages. So let me go ahead and say, the compelling advantage is difference. You create resilience by putting people in different situations and allowing them to accommodate that. That's why I'm so much about this authenticity. Another colleague of ours who's not here um, talks about difference and putting them in situations where the place is different. If you have a, a kid from China, they can operate in that situation already putting them in Australia, which is quite a different situation, creates that flexibility they need then to compete across the, the way. And that's why, again, I, I laid it out in the start, but the research is very clear. Students that have an international experience have higher retention rates, their grades improve, their employability improves, all the testings of kind of global consciousness go up. So I do think there is a, a positive benefit that comes from it. And Roy, I'd add to that that at 17 years of age, uh, I came from a country town up the road called Gosford, 
and I was transported to Tokyo, Japan as a Rotary Exchange student. The bonus I got apart from Japanese language and culture was I learned more about Australia by living away from it uh, at that age and looking at the good things about Australia and the bad things uh, compa comparative to another culture. And that, you can't bottle that, but that meant that Shell Oil Company actually recruited me out of the ANU because they liked the fact I'd had that international exposure that I was a global citizen, if you like. So um, that's going back 30 years ago now, but um, I guess it's kind of what Ken's talking about. OK, there's a question there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jackie Cranny from UNSW. I'm, um, I'm wondering, you haven't mentioned internationalisation of the curriculum or internationalisation at home at all, and I'm just wondering uh, whether any of the speakers have a view on uh, whether that's worthwhile. I know it doesn't um, involve wonderful experiences in a different country or academics going to wonderful ex um, and, and so on. Um, and it involves a lot of hard work on the, and a lot of professional development. Um, but what's your view? So uh, I can't see you, but this is Kent. <laughs> um, I guess you've got a video screen to see. Um, I'm a big supporter of internationalization within the curriculum. But I, I don't think that's aimed at the same thing as internationalization by going abroad is aimed at, where the experience is aimed at putting someone in a different situation and having them navigate that. I think what international in the curriculum is aimed at for me is a lot of the disciplinary content that we are teaching um, is globalized. It's not localized. And so if you don't internationalize, you're not exposing that to them. So just one example from my disciplinary. I'm a, I'm a lawyer, and I teach comparative law, particularly Japanese law. And as Phil just said with regards to his personal experience, I can teach you a lot about how to interpret Australian statutes by looking at how Japanese interpret Japanese statutes. That comparative lesson, even in a field that could be as parochial as law, is very great. And so move into something like business, which by its nature is very internationalized. I think you have to internationalize the, the curriculum. Otherwise, you get very um, outdated parochial views, views. But that's my opinion. <laughs> so I, I suppose the, each institution is different. We did a survey of Australian or our, our domestic undergraduates in, in ANU, and we found that 30% of them had been abroad 10 or more times before starting university. Uh, so for that group, for me to say you need to come to ANU because you get to go overseas isn't a selling point, isn't particularly compelling. And I think they're the ones who are going to much more, be much more attuned to how we incorporate the international experience into, their, into the curriculum and into the, the, their teaching outcomes. Uh, also, I think about 50% of our academics are, are from outside of Australia. So in a sense, there's a, there's a very strong international flavor in the work that they bring to the university anyway. Now, that, I know that this is a, probably a slight outlier in terms of, of, um, of, of a of typical profile. So we're very fortunate uh, from that perspective. I'd just add that we do regard it as very important. Um, my association, one of our five special interest groups, is actually on curriculum internationalization. And it used to be chaired by Behi Lesk, now at the Trobe Uni. It's, uh, now chaired by Craig Whitstead at uh, Murdoch University. But uh, there's a lot of barriers, obviously, that we come across. And one of the barriers I think Kent's identified in some of the presentations I've heard him address is the uh, alignment of academic years and how often the, um, uh, I guess, the fact that so many of the academic years are different between countries is not conducive to having a curriculum that can be easily transplanted um, across different uh, countries and different institutions. So there's a lot of work being done in the space, but um, it's too much work in progress. We've got a question just here. Hi, uh, yeah, Tim Moore from Swinburne. Um, look, I'm, I'm interested in the comments that you've, <coughs> um, I think it was the first two speakers, referred to um, the issue of authenticity and um, the problems of you know, fairly short term, or the limitations of fairly short term um, <coughs> programs. <laughs> And I'm just wondering what you've <coughs> got to say about those challenges in relation to um, the really kind of parlous state of um, the learning of languages other than English, um, <coughs> both at the secondary... Well, it's pretty disastrous at the secondary level, but I think even you know, really disastrous at the, the tertiary level. And whether we can really think <coughs> that our students can have a sort of genuine and authentic 
cross-cultural experience abroad when there is an underlying assumption that the whole um, interaction is going to be conducted in English. Um, I'll jump at this with a different hat on. I, languages are one of the things that I'm involved with. Um, I, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, the, the current state of Australia, the, the national figures, the most recent national figures we have are 2008, and they say 12% of our year 12 students are doing a language. Um, and I just looked at, I'm in South Australia, our numbers since then have, we just fell another 50% from, <laughs> from three other falls from that. Um, the belief that the monolingualism of English will, will, trans, will allow us to do what we want to do, the country to do what we want to do in the 21st century is, is just misplaced. That being said, English is a means of communication and um, we shouldn't devalue that. And indeed, uh, I've written a lot about how we should actually embrace that and, and celebrate that. In the end, though, for that deep authenticity, I do think you need the second language, but hopefully by the first step of going in English, having that experience that gets the excitement about the language learning to come through. I know that's a somewhat indirect response. Um, I'll just respond that for, met, for about nine years in Victoria, I chaired a ministerial council on coordinating the teaching of foreign languages, and we actually achieved some really good stuff. We managed to make um, language te teaching compulsory from prep up to year 10, but importantly, by giving bonus points for any student in Victoria who took a foreign language up to year 12, we actually doubled the number of students who carried on with that foreign language. There are so many challenges in this space though. How do you ensure that the local primary school teaches a foreign language that then the local secondary school is also teaching? Otherwise mums and dads and kids get very upset that they can't carry on the uh, learning of that language um, in their local community. Um, how do you provide recognition for the fact that foreign languages do entail a lot of additional study? How do you get around an issue with the teachers union we had in Victoria where they required a qualified Australian teacher to be standing alongside of a Japanese girl who might be a cadet teacher but was a native language speaker that the kids were relating to but you had to pay extra because you had to have an Australian teacher standing next to them. There are many issues associated with the barriers for expansion of languages and I think again government could play a transformative if not a disruptive role in that space. We've got, I think, two more questions and about two minutes. So um, I think you're first. Uh, yeah. uh, no, it's one here, sorry, at the front. Um, Diana Cousins from RMIT in Melbourne. Um, I'm wondering about the branch campuses and what their impact is on um, competition because um, not only for overseas students, say maybe Indian students might find it cheaper to study in Malaysia or Vietnam or somewhere, but I mean if there was fee deregulation potentially Australian students might also find it cheaper to get Australian branded degrees over in Malaysia and Vietnam for example. So what do you think about that? <laughs> Look, I'll enter the fray there. Just to say that clearly there are many impediments also to Australian students studying um, in any length of time abroad. A lot of the research shows they don't want to give up their part-time job back here in Australia, they don't want to give up friendship networks and so on. Having said that, I think that clearly price is going to become a greater determinant of study destination and you know, Eric, not jokingly I think, but uh, quite rightly pointed to New Zealand um, as uh, an example that's in play at the moment. Uh, but I think that the offshore campuses will only be as good as the quality of the teaching that's occurring at them and also will only be as good as the, I guess, the number of courses they're offering in, in English language, um, if we acknowledge the other gentleman's point uh, before. So there's a lot of work to be done in terms of transnational education endeavour and in all of that mix we have to make sure, as I said, that we um, have appropriate audits and uh, quality assurance mechanisms in place if we're going to promote them as part of Australian quality delivery, we have to ensure that they're up to the task as well. Now, I think there was one question up in that top right corner, but I don't know if they're still there. No, okay, so we'll go to this. This, this will be the last question. 
Sally Knowles from Edith Cowan University. Um, just a quick point uh, from following on from Tim's comment um, about the parlous state of um, language education. Um, I was just going to say that 50% of the world's population is bilingual, and so there are an awful lot of precedents we can look at other education systems, how they're managing that situation. Um, but I actually wanted to reference the OLT to bring it back to them because there is actually a wonderful project that was done at Murdoch University, um, I think an innovation and development grant called Bringing the Learning Home. And it was this very important thing of um, making sure that we value the study abroad experience and that we find ways to embed that in the curriculum. And Jan Gothard, a historian, was the person who did that project. So it's well worth checking out the website. They developed a lot of learning and teaching resources, as well as, I think, a global education unit that they've put up. So um, very important project to mention. Thanks. Thank you. I don't think that was a question. I think that was more a, a, a comment. Con comment and contextual statement. So thank you. Um, well. Uh, would you join me in thanking our three speakers for what has been a very informative session? Thank you.